Spire. Welcome back to Starting Now. I'm your host, Jeff Saris. This is the show where I talk to entrepreneurs to reveal the unexpected paths to entrepreneurship. Today, my guest is Jeff Meyerson. Where do I begin? Jeff is a polymath. He is someone who is so knowledgeable and so experienced in so many different fields. This was a fascinating conversation. We talk about, <laughs> I mean, I don't even know where to begin. This is this is one that's, that's so worth the listen that I think you're going to really get a lot out of and it's really going to make you think. Um, Jeff recently published a book called uh, Move Fast, which is about Facebook and their approach and how you can take the Move Fast approach and apply it to your own creative projects. But we we touched on that briefly, but we dove dove into his music career. He, he creates music. He has seven albums on Spotify, his uh, career at Amazon and how he's started countless companies, how he's started a new company in the gaming space, specifically card collectible card gaming um, called Supercompute, how he has something that he's starting in crypto called uh, Rectangle, but we don't really know much about that just yet because it's still really early stages. But this was such a fascinating conversation. I'm really excited for you to check it out. So without further ado, my conversation with Jeff Meyerson. But yeah, so yeah, I just wanted to ask about board games. Like I am a big fan of board games. I saw that you were big into magic. You you wrote a little bit about maybe your uh, distaste for Settlers of Catan and yeah. and um, Dominion and how you were a fan of Dominion and that system. Does does that play, does that play a role into um, your life currently? Is that something that you're interested in now? It is. Uh, so I'm starting a company called Supercompute, which is building the best digital collectible card game on the internet. And it draws on my learnings from playing magic at the professional level, playing poker at the professional level, playing Dominion very seriously, but never very good. <laughs> um, I played a little bit of Hearthstone. I played a wide variety of board games. So I have a lot of opinions about board games, um, specifically which ones are the best, what are the game design flaws of certain games. Um, Actually, so but, but, just to real quick, what would you say? So to you, what are some of the best games? Magic is the best game. It's not really close as far as I'm concerned. And it's because there's so much depth to that game by virtue of the number of pieces available. It's it's just got longevity and it's compounding. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to beat a compounding force like Magic when it has a, a you know fairly you know well-developed community, lots of network effects. Magic has the fundamental flaw of mana screw. It's got some other fundamental flaws that we could talk about. But yeah, Magic is the best game. Um, all, all the other ones are just second fiddle. Poker, poker is a very pure game as well. I think poker is a, poker is a wonderful game, and it's kind of unparalleled because it's the only real gambling game of skill. But um, yeah, 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 that is a really good point. It, it's a gambling game of skill. I haven't thought about it in that way. It's and it's the only one, other than maybe backgammon. Oh yeah, interesting. And do you then focus mostly on card games specifically? Have you gotten into more um, any of the more tabletop um, with more components and things? Like I know Catan. Played some Catan. Played some Power Grid. Played a lot of Temporum. You ever played Temporum? I know the name. I don't think I've played that one. Temporum's a board game developed by Donald X, the Dominion guy. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Have you tried Anachrony? Have no. you heard of that one? So that one is, it's very deep. It's like a worker placement, but there's a lot of moving parts to wrap your head around. And it's it's one of those that to me is, in terms of board games, one of my just like favorites. It really, it, hmm. it has that crunch to it where it's hard to what get What does that it term first. mean? Why do people say that word crunch? What does it actually mean? Usually I think it, it just means that um, it really makes you think where you're like, okay, I can make this move. But if I make gotcha. this move, where is it? How is it going to play into my entire strategy? Like, I am see. I going to move forward? Am I going to do something here that might help them, hurt them? Just, yeah, just the added depth that I think it has to it is is interesting. But yeah, I mean, that's one I definitely recommend if you were curious about dabbling in the tabletop uh, world a little more. 
I'm I'm gonna look it up right now. It's called Anachrony. Yeah, Anachrony, and it's it's based on time travel. It's uh, David Turksey. <laughs> he it's a phenomenal game. He's a phenomenal developer. It plays really well solo as well, which is very rare for something like that. But mm-hmm. he built this this card based bot that plays like another player. So you're actually able to to play a full game even if you don't have like a game group tonight or something like that. It's really interesting. Got it. Is this game $120? It is expensive. Um, there are, like, I don't know if it's available available right now or if it's the aftermarket you're seeing. I'm not sure. But it it was sort of in and out of print for a little bit because they did this Whoa. ultimate edition. But yeah, there is, there's, there's a lot going on. And he has interchangeable components. So it's almost like, um, like expansions and things that you can pull in, pull out. And it adds to, adds to the systems and the story of the game. But yeah, I'm a big fan of that. So I, I always like to re- just recommend it to fellow gamers just to see what they think. But enough of that. Back to you. So Supercompute. So what does that look like to be developing? Um, because, yeah, I saw that it said the card game of the future. And you mentioned that it's a collectible card game. So where are you headed with that? We're raising our pre-seed round right now and assembling the team. We're marching towards a launch of it's looking like mid-august it was going to be mid-september but i just realized we were basically a month ahead of schedule and we're probably going to be launching the first version of the product by by uh by early mid-may so the the main uh time sink for me is really fundraising right now and then we have a a couple of people on the team that are heavily involved right now. Um, one person who's play, who's doing play testing, like cardboard play testing, and then one person who's developing the game engine and the interface. Yeah. So now, is it going to be sort of um, a callback to Magic and games like that? It's a callback in the sense that we want to. I feel a great sense of injustice in terms of what Wizards of the Coast is doing to Magic the Gathering. It's really hurting my feelings. Mm-hmm. And we we really want to just just decimate them and <laughs> um and 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 really just take their entire market because we have a superior game. Yeah. So and is that something that you had been developing for a long time? Did you bring in a team specifically with the vision? I know it, it seems pretty tight-lipped currently, like from looking online, that there's not a lot of info about it just yet. So anything you're comfortable sharing, like at this early stage? I've been developing this game since I was 11 years old. Awesome. So when I was 11 years old, I started playing Pokemon. Immediately, I was hooked. Started playing Magic at 12. Started playing Magic professionally when I was 15 started playing poker professionally when I was 17, started playing high stakes poker when I was 19, studied game development, game design, game engineering in college, developed my own game, and I've been playing games for a very long time. I've been thinking about the problems in gaming for a pretty long time. I basically churned out of gaming as a customer because I was dissatisfied with all the available options. Um, I went into software engineering and focused on on the game of software engineering and venture capital for a pretty long time. Got kind of tired of that game, really wanted to focus on the game of entrepreneurship, have failed a lot at the game of entrepreneurship, and finally realized that the entrepreneurial endeavor that I'm best positioned for is a games company. So that's where I landed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that makes perfect sense because like, I really see entrepreneurship, like problem solving, all of this really fitting in with the game gaming world because it is sort of the the adult competition that we're able to do where whether we're competing with ourselves with someone else with developing this uh this skill set like it really feels like it it ties together really well with with a gaming sort of background so when I, I like to dive into origin stories, but first, let me just say, so where are you at right now? Like, how do you describe, because you do a lot of things. You're a podcaster, you've had, you mentioned you're doing venture capital, you've worked um, worked at Amazon, you're an author, a published author now, and we're going to dive into all that. But how, what's sort of the, um, the elevator pitch of who um, Jeff is today? I have a lot that I want to express, 
and it takes me a lot of time to express it appropriately. And it's a multi-medium sense of expression. So really, I'm just trying to convey to the world how I see the world. And that's sort of just what I bring to the table. Yeah, I like that. And you're doing that definitely through a multimedia approach with the podcast, with your music. It's uh, the Prion, correct? Um, is the name yeah. of yeah, and yeah, you've I really, I really appreciate <clears throat> all of the different things that you've done over the years and that you're continuing to pursue. And I love that Supercompute feels like this is the new thing, and it feels like something that really harkens back to to who you are. So, what's your tra- right. trajectory then from? going from professional like poker player or um, like high level poker and all of these things into uh, software engineering and Amazon and all of that. My biggest flaw as a poker player was that I was, I tried to get a little bit too creative too fast. So as a games player, I'm sure you view gaming as a form of self-expression. Every strategy you design is an, is a work of art and it's a work of art that's trying to exploit your opponents or exploit the game or solve the, solve the game like a maze. You're just applying creativity to a game. And, um, you know, poker is, is a very brutal way of experiencing that creativity. And um, it's, it's a brutal predatory game um, that I happened to, to get destroyed at. You know, I, I, I tried to play at the highest level and I basically got destroyed. I got, I, you know, got my got my ass handed to me. Um, so, you know, so I was licking my wounds and then I studied computer science and, um, and, uh, got pretty heavily into computer music when I was in, uh, when I was in school. Uh, so instead of working on my software projects, I was, I was pretty focused on music and, um, and then I got into software podcasting a pretty meaningful way in college. And then more seriously after college, are we both drinking green drinks? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I have matcha right now. <laughs> nice. Okay, you've got matcha. I've got a green drink. I've got a. I've got a juice, but nice. Nice. That's great. <laughs> green drink duality. Uh huh. <laughs> um, so you're a matcha drinker. You uh, you um, do you do it like the ritualistic way, like with the with the proper preparation and everything? No, I mean I prepare it my way. I like. I oh, do that's like... mate. That's mate. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of mate. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't like. I was thinking you meant sort of the whisk in the bowl and everything. You do have like that is sort what of I was ceremony. thinking about. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that is that is matcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I have sort of the the hack together way. I have a little uh strainer that I strain it out with, and just a little mm. milk frother. So nowhere near that level of that's <laughs> ceremonial. that's still ceremonial. It I mean, is. that's not a tea bag. Like a tea bag is is what you would expect. But uh-huh. That's that's more than a tea bag. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoy it, and I've just I've actually just gotten back into drinking it again. I used to drink it a lot more. I've been drinking coffee more lately, but I don't know. You forget about that, and I'm like, oh, I really enjoy it. Good all around. But yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, so you um, got into music a lot when you were in in college doing software engineering, and then like you found yourself at Amazon. So um, I want to I want to sort of zoom <laughs> forward then because um, I want to dive into the book and everything that um, that you're doing with that with move fast and like so what is what does it mean to move fast and and how does how does Facebook fit into that because that's sort of the the key. Uh, the key sort of touchstone of the book is how Facebook does this. The, the book move fast is both directly about Facebook and an allegory for how I believe creative projects should be managed. I believe that we have a limited amount of time on this planet and we should be spending that time expeditiously pursuing our greatest goals. Facebook does this at scale so Facebook is a shining example of this procedure. Um, the book Move Fast is meant to outline how Facebook does this at scale, because if you understand how to do it at scale, you can understand how to do it as an individual. Yeah, and so as an individual, as you, how do you sort of apply these principles to what you're working on? I, I mean, a lot of people might see what I do I know a lot of people do see what I do and they think I'm like a disorganized person. They think they think I'm disorganized. I'm like pushing in a bunch of different things. I'm, t- I'm totally unfocused. I don't know what I'm doing. And that's fine because I get underestimated all the time. 
But really what I do is I have a portfolio of projects. Some of those projects are time bound. Some of those are not. And I get to rotate between them and I don't have to answer to anybody. Um, I own my own businesses. I have investments. I have creative projects. And basically every day I wake up and I make my own schedule and I work on what I'm interested in. And I, I keep a pretty heavy calendar, but um, I was very deliberate about how I designed this life uh, because I like to work on a lot of different things at once because there's synergies in working on different things at once. It, it, it is a portfolio strategy. You are managing a portfolio of your own projects and those projects have synergies and they have overlaps. And the advantage of having a portfolio of projects is they're automatically hedged against one another because most of the time, none of your projects work out. I mean, there are so many times in my life where I've basically held a portfolio of 10 worthless projects. And it's like, I, but luckily I didn't know how worthless my portfolio was because I probably would have given up. But, you know, your goal is to basically see the portfolio of projects, your own projects, maybe Maybe, maybe a job is one of those things in your portfolio, but I talk about this in the book, this portfolio strategy idea. And, and in the book, it's about how Facebook manages its portfolio of companies, but really it's an allegory for how you as an individual manage the things that you spend time on. Yeah. So what are some of the synergies then that you have found, like the most valuable synergies across these different projects? Um, there's synergy. It's, it's an end by end. Um, it's an end by end relationship. Everything has synergies with each other. Um, I would say like a very obvious, a very, a very straightforward example to explain is when I was in school, I was learning about software engineering and I was realizing that I didn't know of anybody that was really applying software engineering best practices to music at scale. So I realized that that was a goal of mine. That would be a goal of mine for the rest of my life to figure out how to apply software engineering at scale to the creation of music. And I realized that I needed to put as much effort into that as possible at all stages of my life. So essentially, at any given point in my life, there is a margin of time that I have available to me, and I try to allocate that margin to music. And that's how I've produced albums. Um, I just produced my seventh album, by the way, if anybody wants to listen to it, it's called simulation. It's, it's definitely my best work. It's still not great, but it's my best work. So that's one example. Another example is this supercompute idea. You know, I've been doing podcast episodes about software engineering for, for six years, six years, 50 weeks per year, five shows per week. That's 250 shows per year times wow. six years is about 1500 shows. So about 1500 shows, that's 1500 hours of deep technical content. I have a lot of opinions about how to run a software company. And when I look at how Wizards of the Coast runs their digital product suite, I'm frankly a little bit disappointed. So we want to do that differently. We want to attack the digital card game market in the way that a software company would if you actually built that software properly, as opposed to slapdash and not really well planned. Uh -huh. So what does that mean then, like sort of in more to the brass tacks of applying a software engineering approach to music or to the, the game. In, in the terms of music, let's take a, so you're a software engineer. Um, yeah, developer it's yeah. Developer designer, not to the degree that I believe you are. I'm more, uh, web type stuff. Sure. Simple okay. Web stuff. Great. I mean, but you'll understand this. So, I mm -hmm. mean, so for, let's take a very simple example of naming your variables correctly. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm not sure how many musicians name their instruments correctly. How many in, how many musicians organize their mixer channels properly? Um, I mean, do you need to do that? Honestly, sometimes you don't because you're just working on an experimental project. You're trying to move really, really, really fast. You don't need to name your mixer channels. Who cares? You're just going to wire all your hi-hats to the same channel. You're going to add some compression to that channel and you're done. And you don't need to label that channel. Who cares? But if you're saying, if your architectural strategy is to say, look, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write a hit record. If you're going to sit down and just work on one song until you write a hit record, you better be naming your variables properly. You better need be naming your mixer channels. You better be organizing everything properly. Because if you don't, you're just going to end up in a spaghetti code situation. <laughs> yeah, I really like that. That's and that, that is a true synergy, really overlapping your skill set. So in what ways would you say that would benefit someone, someone who isn't a software engineer, but is a musician? Um, what are the ways, like what, what do they get out of it in the end in doing it that way? So the, one of the reasons I've had a lot of trouble working with most of the musicians that I meet is that they really don't take their craft seriously. There are even professional musicians who don't seem to take their craft seriously. And basically 
their way of writing music is they just like like sit down and kind of hope inspiration strikes rather than taking a very very focused and deterministic approach to producing music that's not to say like i am the authoritative source on how one should write music it's just my style like i sit down to write good music every time i try to write music i write try to write good music i don't like to throw away music like i'm very much from the school of thought of like if something is marginally good you should try to make it better and kind of iterate there are certainly are times when i throw out something completely just like i've thrown out plenty of software projects completely but generally speaking you know if life gives you lemons you make lemonade if you're if you've got a marginally good song you turn it into a better song and sometimes that turns into a great song yeah and i imagine too even when you do throw them away you there's something that you get out of that maybe you've worked out some sort of maybe there's there's a line in there whether it's lyrics or music or whatever it is that you're like i like that maybe as a piece it doesn't work but do you find that later a component like that might play a role in a future song that you might put together sometimes i would say more often what happens is you 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 learn from the failure case so you you basically get to a point where literally you've written a song that's terrible and has no salvageability and you ask yourself how did i get here i've spent 5 hours writing this song and it sounds like somebody's just screaming like i don't want to, why would anybody listen to this it just sounds like somebody <laughs> screaming into a microphone it's terrible it's totally unlistenable how did i get into this situation and you retrace your steps and you realize like oh the reason is because I was sick last night and I didn't get much sleep and I woke up to work on my music and I wasn't in good shape and like I forgot to work out. I didn't go for a run. I didn't get fresh air. Like I had bad coffee, whatever. You know, it's like you tr- you retrace your steps and you start to learn, okay, what are the conditions that lead to good music? What are the conditions that lead to bad music? How do I avoid the latter? Yeah. And yeah, that is the it's the problem solver. You're you're applying problem solving to all these areas and a very successful way. What, what would you to you? What makes a good song? I th- I feel like it's a really difficult question. Like it's, there isn't like a right answer. But do you have any sort of metrics? I just listen to Max Martin's music. Okay. Do you know? Do you know who Max Martin? You actually kind of look like Max Martin. Do you know who oh, that really? is? No, I'm not familiar. So he's the best songwriter of all time. Uh, and the reason I say that, I, I, I'm sure a lot of people are going to take issue with that. I'm just kind of like saying purely on who has had the most success on the pop charts. It's Max Martin definitively. So um, I'm just going to rattle off some artists that basically have written, uh, have had all their music, all their most important music written by or heavily influenced by Max Martin. So in sync backstreet boys, Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, um, Evan, I think Evanescence, maybe not Evan. No, not Evanescence. Uh, Dua Lipa. I think the weekend for sure. Justin Bieber, I think, uh, at least one Zed song. Um, basically, the guy's just prolific. He's yeah. in, he's been involved in every generation of music since like 1995 or 1996 or something in in basically like top form. So he's just like the ultimate producer. He's like the consummate guy that an artist call Lady Gaga. He's the consummate guy that an artist calls on when they're like, "I'm creatively blocked. Can you come and help me?" Like, that's how I see myself. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to be the best in the world at is I want to be the producer that all the best artists call on when they're creatively blocked. Yeah, that's, I mean, that is a massive resume. That That is amazing. And that is something also like amazing to aspire to as well. And like currently with what you're doing in music, not to, not to just focus on music, but I find it really interesting, especially how you're combining your like engineering, software engineering approach to it. Um, but do you do everything in terms of the music or do you hire people? I, I saw you either allude to maybe use, working with some Fiverr artists at one point. And, Correct. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm so glad you brought this up because this is the future of music. So this, the, the acquisition of Spotify that flew under most people's radar that should not have is a company called Sound Better. There's a company called Sound Better that is essentially a Fiverr specifically for musicians. So you can go on Sound Better and you can hire producers, you can hire singers, you can hire songwriters, you can hire anybody in the artistic supply chain of music, and they will work with you. And they will do very, very good work, especially if they're somebody with you know a bunch of five-star ratings. So 
you know, um, I, I, um, you know, I had been working on this business ad for prize. I sunk all my money into it. I went broke. Um, I had maybe like, I don't know, 20 K left. So I was like, okay, what can I do with 20 K? That's like kind of fun. And, um, and so I decided to write this album called gig economy and, uh, to write gig economy. I hired these artists from sound better and from Fiverr and from some other places and, uh, kind of put together an, like a super team of, uh, <laughs> of like on demand musicians. And I really liked the results. And I think this is the future of music. And I've got some startup ideas around this that you'll see in the coming years. Um, but, but more importantly, I just kind of learned that like really the key to writing good music is teamwork and delegation. Yeah. And that's probably the key. Would you agree even with the, with the entrepreneurial endeavors as well? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Like it feels so important. Like we run a minimalist business. It's me and my business partner, Dave, never been funded, no employees ever, but we do everything in house, but it's just that we work so well together. Like we complement each other in almost every way. And like, we've been asked like, Oh, how do you find a good co-founder, this and that. And all I can say from my experience is essentially get lucky. Like, I know that there, there can be more for sure, but like what happened to us, it just, we just sort of fell in to becoming friends and uh, co-conspirators in this. Um, do you have any insight into what it would, what it looks like to build a good team? Well, I'm trying to, to do that right now with Supercompute. Um, and what I'm realizing is like, so I, I think the number one trait that's most important is some combination of friendship and loyalty and blind faith. Um, those are like prerequisites. And then obviously there's like technical skill or like perspicacity or whatever. Um, but, you know, ultimately, like you're never, ever going to attract any kind of meaningful talent unless you sort of show that you are capable of 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 putting something together so you know a lot of my career has basically been like look i want to do proof of work like you know you know proof of work for like blockchains right oh, yeah so like i want to do proof of work for jeff right like i want anybody to basically look at my career and realize that okay literally at every point in his career jeff was working himself to the bone like, I don't want anybody to have any doubt about who the hardest person, hardest working person in the room is. Yeah. And this is a little, a little bit of a tangent, but what does a typical day look like for you right now? Um, yeah. So, okay. So I'm, I mean, I'm a really bad example right now because I'm not getting as much sleep as I should. Um, things have been a little crazy lately. Um, but like today, um, like, uh, I got a bunch of bros in town <laughs> and, um, and like, yeah, like I woke up pretty early, uh, like four or five a.m. because like I'm not sleeping super well lately. I, I'm I'm like <laughs> I, I'm I'm not sleeping as well as I should. So so I so I woke up pretty early, um, listened to some music, went to the gym, hit the punching bag, uh, went for a run, got a cup of tea, um, and then you know I had a friend come over. We hung we you know we hung out for a bit. Um, I had a few phone calls. Uh, had some investor pitches, had an interview that I did, podcast interview, um, did a little bit of mixing on a song I'm working on, um, had a few Slack conversations with a few companies I'm working on, um, had a look at a few portfolio companies and a few potential investment deals. Um, and then, yeah, got on the podcast with you and I got a green drink in my right hand. Yeah, that's, yeah, just a few things. Really, that's... <laughs> That is a jam-packed day all of all across the board. I mean, in terms of like work, work, like really like in the weeds work, in terms of hanging out with friends and working out and all of these things, that actually feels, despite being so much, it actually feels really balanced in a like almost strange way. Definitely. I mean, my main goal is to eliminate boredom in my life so that I don't have to confront the existential dread that is inherent in our really reality. So like, I just want to, you know, hide from reality, basically. <laughs> what is that existential dread for you? I think we've all had the situation where we're sitting in a room and just feeling very bleak about life. And I don't like feeling that way. Yeah. So then are you, you replacing that or, um, overpowering that then with the things that you're you're doing is that sort of the approach i i that's that's been that's what's worked well for me yeah yeah i mean it sounds like you've also you've gotten a lot you've achieved a lot and actually 
off offhand, how many different companies have you started and how many have sustained like till today and how many have you sunsetted? So are we talking about like companies that I actually incorporated or like product ideas? Um, I guess ideas is a better, yeah, ideas is a better uh, way to look at Ooh, it. Ooh, um, I can't even count, man. Like <laughs> that's what I thought. There's a lot of really bad ones. The most, I mean, the first really significant one that I tried was uh, this thing, Ad for Prize, that I went broke doing. <laughs> um, it was this like uh, advertising social network thing where you make ads. Um, so there's ad for prize. That was pretty cool, but I went broke doing it. Uh, then I did pod sheets was like, which is like a podcast platform. Uh, it had co-founder issues there. I did find collabs, which was, um, just a business that didn't really have product market fit. I did software daily, which kind of has potential still. And that's um, the podcast or is that uh, well software? so i have software engineering daily, which gotcha. was, it's, it's kind of a long story. So I have software engineering daily, which was the podcast. And then I sort of simultaneously rebranded the podcast and made a website called Software Daily, which is our homegrown platform. It's sort of like a social network podcast thing that doesn't really have any users <laughs> except for bots. And um, yeah, and then there's, and then there's, and then I think I finally ironed out, like, I think I'm finally done, like, with terrible ideas. <laughs> finally, like, it takes me a long time to learn. I just like to beat my head against the wall until I learn. That's my style. <laughs> Um, I think with the companies that I'm working on now, Supercompute and Rectangle and uh, Software Daily, like I think I think Software Daily, the podcast at least. So I think with those three ideas, like I really got some pretty good traction. And what is Rectangle? I can't talk that much about Rectangle oh, okay. yet. Um, you'll see you'll see announcements soon, but it it's going to be momentous and hilarious. <laughs> nice, <laughs> <laughs> perfect combination. <laughs> so how do you then? Because that's a lot of projects, a lot of funding, and I know you're pitching and things. How have you uh, managed your personal income and things over the years? Because, I mean, this life, it's a roller coaster, you know? I mean, like flying high and then sort of in the dip. With everything going on, I imagine there's a lot of money coming out, but you also have your income streams coming in. Um, what does what um, your sort of portfolio look like in that sense? It actually looks pretty good these days. Uh, there have been times where it's looked very reckless. I, like I said, I've gone broke a couple times. I went broke playing poker. I went broke on ad for prize. Since then, I've been a little bit more financially responsible. Um, you know, I make sure to get the core business in order. Software Engineering Daily slash Software Daily is is very much a well run business. It's high margin uh, for what it is. It's it's just a great business. And what's the revenue model in that? Sorry, not to interrupt, but. Yeah, so it's it's pretty straightforward. I mean, we we host podcasts, we do five shows per week, and we run ads against those those shows. And we have a really really well run sales organization around those podcast ads. Um, you know, part of the reason for starting this business was I wanted to learn sales in a very scalable way. I wanted to learn enterprise sales, and I I did learn that doing software daily. Yeah, and so when you have the market, the sales team is that in-house is that something you contracted out it's a little bit of a combination of the two okay yeah so so sales is sales is really fun um i i recommend anybody who can figure out a business that requires some kind of soft enterprise enterprise sort of sales it, it sounds kind of scary it's actually extremely fun um i would really encourage like figuring out how to build it, like a sales driven business it's so much fun nice and was this the first approach for you the first uh, trial for you in figuring that out Yes, I had not sold anything before uh, before selling podcast ads. Well, wow. so what were your first uh, steps into that for someone? So you have all the experience elsewhere, but like, I just, I want to touch on this. I just, I love that you're taking, like, I have this weak spot. I want to get better at this. Now, let me find how that fits into a business idea or a product mm -hmm. idea. Like, I've always said, like, I don't have hobbies. I have businesses. Like, I've always just... Sure. Falling down a rabbit hole of something. And then I start sure. something alongside it because that's, we learn so well from <clears> that. Um, just like you said. So like when it came to sales specifically, where, what was your starting point? Well, so I left Amazon. I had 15 grand in the bank and, um, because I had had to pay back my signing bonus and, um, you know, I was living in an apartment that cost, I think 1800 or 2000 a month. So I basically had like six months, sort of, of runway 
like to kind of to get to break even. So really I had like poverty breathing, you know, breathing down my neck. Um, and I just figured if I just started grinding really, really, really hard, I could, I could make enough to make ends meet. So, um, I think the first company I reached out to was hired.com. And that was after I had done like three or four shows. And I said, Hey, look, I just left Amazon. I'm going all in on this podcast thing. I know hired likes podcast ads. You guys want to sponsor me. And, um, you know, Lily, or uh, uh, what is it? L- uh, Lenny, Lenny Sil- Silwinski, I think is his name, was running ad sales at the time for Hired. He now is the CEO of a unicorn company. Um, I think it's Trusted Trusted Health. It's like this nursing platform. It's kind of random. Like, shout out to Lenny Silwinski because he went from um, he went from like running the podcast ads for Hired to running marketing for Hired to being CEO and founder of a unicorn, just like a fantastic Silicon Valley success story. Wow. Um, anyway, but, but, but yeah, he was my first sale. And I think I sold to um, digital ocean was the second sale. So I remain incredibly loyal to those companies and, uh, and the, and their founders. Yeah. How big, what, what was your pitch on that? Like how many, uh, unique downloads or like uh, average downloads and things were you pitching them with? You know, it was really low back then. I mean, we were, so, I mean, um, the market timing for this business was quite good because we were, because we were, it was, um, it was before there were a lot of software engineering podcasts. So really we were able to say, look, we're young. We've got like 600 listens per episode, but like we're growing pretty fast and, uh, and we're going to do it every day. Like, do you want to buy, I mean, some ridiculous outrageous offer where I was literally like, we're going to sell you 10 podcast ads at $20 a pop or like <laughs> $50 a pop, just something like insanely cheap like that. And they were like, uh, yeah, we'll take that. Uh-huh. You know, and, and cause the, like, that's the thing about podcasts is they're so measurable. Like it's, 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 it's almost like uniquely measurable for, for an advertising product. So it's actually a, quite a good advertising product for many reasons. It's also influencer marketing and, um, and companies were more than willing to pay. Nice. And uniquely measurable because it would be, uh, blah 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 dot com slash software daily. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So you can just track exactly who's buying and who's coming from there. Yeah, that's interesting. And then, have you been able to develop those relationships then along the way? Because you said you're completely loyal. Have they stuck around? And as the ad spend, like the ad needs to be on such a big show, because I think you're doing you're doing real serious numbers of daily downloads, as far as I know right now. And um, have you been able to? nurture those relationships because sometimes like when you start really low at least in in the small business sense the clients then expect oh no it's just this is how much it costs rather than like now i'm sure that leaps and bounds has increased in what your ad uh cost is we have a lot of clients at this point we have a wide variety of clients of all shapes and sizes and um, I mean, mostly at this point, we're doing larger contracts because we just really can't handle the the, the smaller contracts at this point. Um, but uh, you know, we do have a lot of partners that have stayed with us for a long time. I think DigitalOcean hired. I actually, I'm not sure if either of those are partners right now. Hired really tamped down their their podcast advertising at some point. DigitalOcean, I think our price point doesn't make sense for them anymore. And also, they've kind of reached market saturation mm-hmm. with their podcast ads, at least. Um, they're probably still advertising on some other podcasts, but not on ours. Yeah. And what do you think about the long-term viability of the podcast and as a revenue source? Since Because it is, it's sort of the one, the one income stream being ads. And now that there's so many podcasts, you, you have a stronghold. But do you, um, how do you look towards the future? Let me tell you a little bit about my DNA as a as a business operator. So, um, when I when I was uh, eighteen or nineteen, the Unlawful Internet Gambling Enforcement Act prevented American players from putting money onto poker sites using PayPal. And the side effect of this was that all of the bad players stopped putting money onto poker sites. And the side effect of that was that uh, online poker sites slowly lost all of their whales like all of the bad players slowly left online poker and essentially online poker became pros competing against each other when that happened i basically lost my entire bankroll because i couldn't compete with pros as it turned out i was 
I was somebody who could only compete with the weaker players. Um, and what that taught me was that you really, really need to be aware of the weak points in and, and market risks in your business. So what I love about the podcast business is there's not really platform risk. Like people talk about decentralized crypto infrastructure. Actually, podcasting is decentralized media infrastructure. It's been decentralized for a pretty long time because it's just based on open standards like RSS feeds and MP3s. That's fundamentally all you need for podcasts. Um, so um, so I think the medium is pretty secure for now as far as like whether my podcast is secure. So I have done things to try to further um, distance myself from competitors. Uh, one of the things that I've been able to do that I recommend other podcasters do as well is to um, start with a... Uh, a well-defined categorical niche and over time build trust with the audience. Once you've built trust with the audience, you can branch off into your own personality. So basically you become personality as a service. So like, what am I offering to the listener now? I'm offering Jeff Meyerson as a service. Like I'm literally Jeff Meyerson as audio. And, and we actually have like kind of a divergence in our business where we're trying to figure out right now, how do we offer software daily as, as a nice packaged product where we are the authoritative source on all things related to software while also retaining the Jeff Meyerson as a service business. So like these are kind of two distinct product lines because Jeff Meyerson as a service is sort of like an editorial product line and the software daily product line should be more like a news and information product line. So we have the, sort of these two disjunct categories um, that we can treat as independent business lines and, and we're kind of figuring out how to do that. Yeah, I've never thought of that like you as a service. That's a really interesting an interesting way to wrap it. Would you say that that's different than influencer? Like like I liked the the Jeff Myerson as a service specifically, but would you say that those are differing uh, categories? I I I think you know I, I mean the the influencer so the influencer thing is, is is influencers is more of a statement about the macro economy rather than uh, anybody who is a particular influencer. Like my mom is an influencer, right? Like she sends me an email and has influence over me. <laughs> she posts something on Facebook and has influence over me. So everybody is in is an influencer as long as you post on social media or or make emails. You're an influencer. You have influence. Um, so everybody is like sort of de facto an influencer. Um, actually, even if you, even if you do not post, you are sort of an anti-influencer. So you, you know, you, you're, as long as you have friends, your friends are wondering like, why isn't Jeff posting online? Is he like avant-garde or something? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, everyone's an influencer. Um, and I, I don't think about it that way, uh, as much. I don't think. Yeah. Uh, it, it is interesting. I really like, so yeah, splitting up that business in that way. Yeah. So what are you then, what keeps you going? Because like you're, you have success here, you have success there and you're trying all these new things. What's, what's the spark to continue pursuing the different uh, ventures? Um, it's, it really comes back to what I said. Like I have a lot of, um, need for self-expression and I just, I know that that my potential is not fully expressed and materialized in the world. And I have a vision for how that plays out in a realistic way. And I'm just trying to put it into place brick by brick. Yeah. Is there ever a point that you think like sort of like check achieved? Is there any any uh, metric you're looking towards? Um, there is, but it's really, really weird. <laughs> Do you mind sharing it or is that something more personal? I mean, I can share it. It's going to, it's going to confuse you probably. Oh. <laughs> um, so, okay. So the name, so the name of my first album was called wooden computer. And um, the idea of the wooden computer, this is like a, a thought exercise that uh, me and my friend, Austin, Austin Hamburg, he's like one of my best friends. It's this thought exercise that we developed. We were walking around uh, Ladybird Lake in Austin, Texas one day. We we're sort of like thinking about like, where's all this technology stuff leading us? And, and where's all this like, you know, biology stuff leading us. And, and uh, we came up with sort of the the theory of the wooden computer. So, um, the, the 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 idea of the wooden computer is like is like if you are a technologist, you're sort of like aligned 
you're aligned towards and beyond the moment of the wooden computer. So like, what is the moment of the wooden computer? The moment of the wooden computer is the moment when we have the technology to biologically grow a computer that can be programmed. So like, what happens when we have the tools to biologically grow an iPhone? Like, what does that mean for the world? So like, as a technologist, we're all basically aligned around building this wooden computer, this like this like iPhone that is made out of wood, essentially, or made out of plant material or some sort of biological material. We're all aligned around this moment when this happens because like basically it's 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 like an I think at the term is an event horizon. Like you can't really see beyond it, right? Like we can we can we that's it's very conceivable. Like today, like you can just think about like cellular automata and like bioengineering stuff. And it's like pretty conceivable that we can get to the point where we can grow an iPhone. What happens after that? Like what happens when you can grow like a collection of iPhones and they're networked with each other? And like, what is like, what does that mean? Is that like, is that AI or like, is that, is that something different? Like what the, what is that? (laughs) So that's like, like, I want to see that, right? I want to see it, but I want to see it in a safe way too. So like, there's a huge safety question, right? Like, is that, does that just like, destroy, is that like a gray goo outcome? Like, you know, the gray goo, have you heard about the gray goo? Uh, just vaguely, but yeah, how would you uh, explain? I that? mean, the gray goo is like, like if you, like if you accidentally make AI that is just like self-propagating gray goo, like basically any material that the, that the AI touches turns into gray goo. So it just like takes over the universe and turns it into gray goo. <laughs> That's like an outcome that you probably don't want. Um, so like, we're trying to avoid that, right? Like we want to get to wooden computer without the gray goo. Or without like the murderous AI, like obviously the murderous AI is less probable than gray goo, but you really don't want gray goo. Yeah. Um, when you say wooden computer, are is, are we are you thinking like literal, or is that almost a metaphor, or like literally growing, like an iPhone? So I mean, I'm I'm talking literally. I'm saying like we have we we can think about it. Like we can literally like get a bunch of smart people in the room and sort of whiteboard what are some conceivable ways that we could get to wooden computer? And like, that's crazy that we can literally whiteboard this and say, this is, this is kind of conceivable. Like if, you know, if CRISPR works this way and, you know, low level processing technology works this way and we can find some like biological instruction set architecture, then like maybe we can do this as a biological substrate and like maybe it actually works. Maybe we can string these things together. Like maybe we can turn, take a neural link off the shelf and like touch the neural link to the instruction set. I, I don't know what this thing looks like. Like I'm not yeah. an expert in this category. Like I'm not a wooden computer engineer, but like I want to see a wooden computer. Yeah. That is so fascinating. It's, I've never come across that before. I, this is, I mean, this whole chat has been extremely fascinating. <laughs> um, is there anything specifically that has happened that, has you thinking more about that concept, the wooden computer concept being being more plausible? Like, is there a, like you mentioned CRISPR, you mentioned the things that could go into it. Has there been like a thing that it's like, oh, wow, like we're maybe closer than, than we seem or still just as far as we've always thought? This is the other thing that's curious about the wooden computers. We have no idea how close we are. Okay. I mean, I don't. Uh-huh. Do you? <laughs> nah, this is the first time I've even heard of it. Yeah, this is extremely fascinating. Like wow. what? Like I literally could not even. I'm, I mean, maybe like is it ten years off? Is it five years yeah. off? Is it twenty years off? Is it fifty years off? Is it a hundred? I have no idea. And like you said, it's an, it's an event horizon. Like what is what's after that? Who knows? Yeah. And is that sort of then how you're looking at like your career? There's that event horizon of this moment that you sort of can't see past. I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I'm just like, I'm really trying. I mean, my career is kind of like, how do you assemble respect? How do you assemble resources? Um, you know, how do you, you know, how do you avoid the, the wooden computer becoming gray goo? Well, you probably are. You try to be the one who builds the wooden computer, right? Like you try to be the person who aligns around that mission. Um, it's kind of a weird mission. So I don't really like talk to people about it because like, I can't really tell people like, Hey man, like 
really what I'm trying to do here is build a wooden computer <laughs> because I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, like, like, trust me, you don't want to bring wooden computer up during a pitch meeting. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> not that I've ever done that, but I'm yeah. pretty sure you don't want to do that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I this is awesome. Like you, you've given me so many things to think about. I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, but what's the thing, where would you like people to, uh, sort of the next steps for someone who's listening? Um, do you want to send them to the book? Do you want to send them to the podcast? Um, the audience is more like entrepreneurial specific, um, not specifically yeah. software, but where would you like to send them? I think there's two things. So the two, probably two mediums, um, and you can really get this in one piece of product. So, um, you know, I think the, the two things that embody my passions right now are the book that I just published, Move Fast, and um, my most recent album, which is called Simulation. I actually packaged these together as a recent podcast episode. So I, I published my entire audiobook as a podcast episode. And then at the end of it, you can listen to the music that I wrote during the book. So basically, like the book almost killed me writing it over the last two and a half, three years. It was really <laughs> hard to write, uh, but uh, but I finished it. And when I was writing it, it was sort of a cathartic situation where I, I, I could write some music if I was creatively blocked on the book. And, uh, and that album is, is Simulation. So I've got, a, I've got an album and I've got a book sort of as a companion product. And if you just go to Software Engineering Daily or softwaredaily.com, you can just find the Move Fast full audiobook. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. And I don't know how you possibly wrote the book with so many interests, so many things you're pursuing. That had to be... It had to be tough to just sort of heads down on that along with balancing everything else. Like, yeah, it, it, it almost killed me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. One last question, just with regards to move fast and that approach. Are, you've, you mentioned blockchain. Um, have you been looking at crypto at NFTs at all? And like, what do you think about that space? Because that is moving fast, like sure is. so fast. Mm hmm. Yeah, well, it's it's as important as cloud, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you look at cloud. How has cloud changed our lives? It's it's changed our lives in in unimaginable ways. It's it's been a new industrial revolution. So, um, so we've got a new dimension to the industrial revolution now, and that is the the refactoring of finance. I, I, I've, I've rectangle actually is a play on this. Um, I think rectangle is going to be basically the company that unifies the crypto and the fiat ecosystems. Uh, that's that's one way to think about it. It, it. it is the rectangle that sits between the fiat and the crypto ecosystems. The, it's a, it is an infinite rectangle, if one might say. Um, and 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 I think that there's a lot of work to do there. Like, why is it that we have these two partitioned universes where we have crypto on one hand and and fiat on the other? Like, obviously we have a need for fiat currencies. Obviously we have a need for cryptocurrencies. Why are there not synergies between these two platforms? Why do we essentially have these warring factions, you know, why do we have all this, uh, this, this, um, you know, problems of information flows? Why do we have all these, um, you know, sources of self-interest? Um, it's just, there's a lot of problems. Um, but you know, you, you speak about uh, more specifically about crypto and, and, and NFTs, um, you know, crypto today, um, is, is, is going through kind of a, kind of a primitive Renaissance. I mean, we, we're seeing pretty primitive things, uh, you you do have applications such as lending and and borrowing and uh, mortgages kind of and options kind of and synthetics kind of but all of this stuff is fairly inaccessible. It's fairly uh, unintegrated with the global economy. You know, smart contracts are still basically only used for like crypto related things. I have heard that the crypto VCs use smart contracts to mediate venture capital investments in the crypto world. Mm. So. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. There's so much there. Um, I, I think it's super exciting. I think uh, if, if there's one if there's one firm, if there's one organization that you want to watch in the crypto environment, just follow Dragonfly Capital. So Dragonfly Capital is the best crypto firm in the world. They, they're making all the smartest bets. They have the smartest people. Uh, so just they're investors in Rectangle. <laughs> <Nice>. um, <laughs> so, so just follow them. Um, yes. and just look at what they're doing and that'll show you the state of the art of crypto. Yeah. And it feels like it's unlimited, um, opportunity in the space right now because it is so, so early, like even in NFTs and for artists and people who are creating things like your music, I mean, could be distributed as an NFT, could be a 
Um, Because like I've been wondering why there isn't a royalty free music platform for creators to connect with artists where the smart contract is what guarantees they have the license. It can be a non-transferable smart contract. Maybe it's a lifetime. Maybe it's a, a, a period of time. But I mean, that could change that relationship because suddenly you don't need that middleman. You don't really need, say, an epidemic sound or a big licensing firm. Um, but yeah, anyway, just a tangent. I, it just hmm. feels like there's so much opportunity is that, is that a out business, there. Is that a business idea you're thinking about? Um, not about me pursuing. It's something that I see as someone should because... I mean, the thing is, you know, as a musician, I, I don't really care about royalties. I don't even, I don't care about making money. Even for my for my music, I really care about, like, outreach. Like, okay. is this connecting with the listener? It's like royalties are pretty orthogonal to me. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, maybe it matters to, to, like, Zed or to Britney Spears or whatever, but it's just not, it's not ever going to be meaningful capital to me. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess I was thinking more removing sort of that middle, that publisher part um, in terms of when it's getting on television or youtube or movies or whatever but i don't know it's just mm, one thing that popped oh in my head i see what you're saying yeah, I the see royalty what you're saying. Okay. Free, yeah so you're saying like for example like let's say let's say i should i should be able to publish my music so that's a really interesting idea so basically the idea being there's lots of media that's getting created today whether it's youtube shows or um or like youtube um or like social media things like tiktok videos or video games like uh, you know indie video games why is there not a platform where you can like easily publish your music and have that music be 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 adopted and utilized in other media because because as i already said all i really care about is outreach and influence mm-hmm. for my music yeah i think it's an interesting opportunity cuz you have like epidemic sound you have different platforms that do this but removing the platform because like for this podcast i have music i the intro the outro there's going to be music on this and I pay Epidemic Sound a monthly fee to license any of their music. And that's just how it works. But if, say... Hey, listen, listen, man. If you want my music, you got it for free. Pick your song. <laughs> nice. But yeah, like, it, it is just interesting because then suddenly if... I, I think there's something there. It's not fleshed out. It's just something I've been thinking about lately. And to have a direct connection with the artist and it's spreading that music further in a way that isn't um, isn't hindering the artist. But... Anyway, mm. yeah. Mm. Thank you for this chat. This is this has been wonderful. Like cool. it's you've really opened my mind to so many things. Like this is this was fascinating. Like cool. To Good to hear. Thank thank you for having me on. It's been a yeah. real pleasure. You're you're an excellent interviewer. Oh, very well. off, very off the cuff. So no prep. Basically, you 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 didn't have really have any questions prepared. You just kind of like researched what I did. Like I'm very kind of kind of curious about your interview your interviewing style at this point. Like, oh, well, did you did you just did you just sort of do like off the cuff research and then like prepared to, like maybe a few questions and then sort of was just planning to have an, a nice conversation? Yeah. See, I like to just have the conversation and I have like topics that I wanted to touch on. Right. Just because. Right. 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 So like the more I know about you, the better. Um, yeah. But um, I because there's a lot of like I mean not to. I know a lot of this is to promote the book and to get people to read Move Fast, which I recommend that people check it out. But um, that's sort of, that's the thing, that's sort of the circuit, you know, like talking about the topics that um, are in there or the things that that tie in. But I like to sort of dive into the story of the person and yeah, make, help people know who you are and what makes you tick. And hopefully they can pull some things out from your story to then see like, oh, this is who I am compared to Jeff. Now maybe they're applying some of the same approaches to their life or they're realizing, oh, I do have these proclivities too. Maybe I should pursue this or that. So I like to talk to a lot of just a big, uh, diverse cross-section of different entrepreneurs just to really Mm. see who they are and get their different approaches. Mm. Mm. And what's your long-term goal? Um, My long-term goal? Uh, Keep doing what I'm doing. I don't know. Sorry, like, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, no, I'm no. It's all good. Yeah, I'm not used to answering questions. I'm the question asker. But um, yeah, we have our business, Spire. We've done a lot of things over the years. We're a small branding agency. And like our most recognizable like clients are the minimalists. And we've helped them build their platforms and stay Oh, one. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. we have a documentary on Netflix that we produced a few years ago. And you guys produced oh, that? Uh-huh. Yeah. Nicely done. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, it was just a tiny team. Josh Ryan, the minimalist. That's very well regarded. Yeah, it's done well. We're really happy with it. Like we're very proud of what happened. I mean, it's the the film is Matt 
the director like that's really him but we're a small six person team like we did did everything front to back mm-hmm. and yeah really proud of that but yeah just continuing what we're doing this is this podcast is the first thing where myself or Dave my business partner are like in front of the camera for something like we've always mm-hmm. lived behind the scenes we have a bunch of different client relationships and um, different projects and this and that whether it's like health and wellness or like i mentioned hmm. the minimalists and hmm. we do all these things it'd be, be cool to work together at some point like I mean, the minimalists is a really I, th- I felt that was a very very well i don't i don't think i watched the whole thing i think i just watched a part of it but i got what it was trying to do and i thought mm-hmm. it was pretty novel oh well yeah well thank you i'm glad you glad you enjoyed it yeah because that's yeah that's just what what we do we help people are you a min- do you consider yourself a minimalist that's a good question because i do but I don't consider m- minimalism from like the number of things. So it really depends on like how you look at it. Because um, like Josh and Ryan would say, like once once you get rid of the stuff, what's next? That's that's where the real magic is. It's sort of a philosophy of life. So I do consider myself a minimalist. But it's not like I would say I have 112 things or something like sort of the cliche of the old minimalism space. Mm. But my approach to life is more of a minimalist. Like I want to spend my time and do the things that that give me the most return and if that like you if that means i'm sitting heads down working really hard at something that's perfect because that's what i want in that moment but i Mm. try to get rid of the clutter from my life and from my physical space things that would Mm. get in the way of me doing that or spending time on a beach going on vacation whatever it is but finding my Mm. path to that to my to my like a quote-unquote perfect life yeah cool I like the mission. Yeah. Well, anyway, this has been this has been great. Like, yeah, I enjoyed again. the conversation as well. Yeah. Thanks again for taking the time, and I definitely recommend people check out your book, Move Fast, to dive into that story and everything else that you're up to. Because this, yeah, you you're doing a lot of a lot of killer stuff. So <laughs> I like thank it you. a lot. Appreciate that. I want to thank Jeff for joining me on this episode. Be sure to check out his book, Move Fast, and also the uh, companion music that he wrote. And you can find the Prion on uh, Spotify. That's P-R-I-O-N. As always, this episode of Starting Now is brought to you by Built. At Built, we help you get started online. Whether you want to start a blog or a business, head over to built.co. That's B-Y-L-T dot C-O to get started. Built. Your website, built for you, simply. Finally, if you're enjoying this show, be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening right now and uh, give us a thumbs up on Facebook if you're enjoying the video version. Well, that'll do it again for this week. I'm Jeff Saris. This has been Starting Now, and I will see you next time.